Your commentator is Robert Stevenson. America goes to war. Men of the Army, Navy, and Marines reinforce the battlefronts on six continents to save the homes and ideals of free men from Axis domination. In Ireland, United States fighting men, who have safely crossed the submarine-infested Atlantic, strengthen their ever-increasing ranks. Yanks on the march on Irish sub. The worldwide conflict brings intrepid American airmen to China's heroic fighting front. General Chenault, United States Air Force Chief in China, flies with his brave command to strike effective blows at the invading Japs. Later, with Colonel Scott, he observes his men in action. 10,000 miles from home, men and supplies pour in through India, the last doorway to China. Cheerful yet determined, welcome strangers in a strange land. Off the coast of Alaska, jutting sharply into the Pacific and the slate gray Bering Sea, lie the bleak Aleutian Islands. Here, Jap airmen bomb American soil and ships. Here, our defenders seek the enemy, determined to drive him from American shores. Destroyers guard transports and cargo ships to land troops and supplies on a fog-swept island near the enemy-held Kiska. Men, stores, and ammunition pour in for the Battle of the Aleutians, a battle that Americans must win. American naval guns open up on the Jap-held Solomon Islands. Guadalcanal, United States Marines in a swift surprise invasion add new glories to the fighting career of their illustrious corps. The retreating Japs attempt to destroy their newly completed air base. It is quickly captured by the Leathernecks and renamed Henderson Field. The Marines, later reinforced by army troops, battle fiercely to hold their ground. Some of the enemy escape in a hurry. Others get out of the fight as prisoners. History recorded as it happened. The Marines are the first to raise the American flag on enemy territory. Seeking out and blasting Hitler's U-boats is the rough, tough job of naval aviators and men of the Coast Guard. Hundreds of ships, including vitally needed tankers, are hit, burned, and sunk, victims of prowling enemy submarines. American waters become a battlefront. In the Caribbean, more ships run off all the enemy fire, but greater combat action gets results as convoys steam through to their destinations. Russia meets the grim test. Despite repeated attacks by crushing panzer units, pushing on desperately toward the Caucasus and into the streets of Stalingrad, Marshal Semyon Timoshenko's relentless armies take a terrific toll of the enemy and upset his invasion timetable. The Russians meet the Nazis in close and often hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A German sniper is picked off by a Soviet sharpshooter. Another Nazi tries to surrender, but too late. Britain's Prime Minister flies to Moscow. Eyes and ears the world over are focused on a conference of historic importance. Churchill meets Stalin behind the walled fortress of the Kremlin.
Rio de Janeiro, nerve center of the largest country in South America, is the scene of a history-making demonstration. All-out war is declared as a result of the ruthless Axis attacks on Brazilian ships and an appalling loss of lives. Brazil goes to war. Silk-like mists blanket a lifeless channel as a strong force of fearless Canadians accompanied by British, American and Free French breathlessly await daybreak in the grim job ahead. The job of invading the German-held French coast. Dieppe is their battle objective and the hardy Canadians and their allies have been training for months for the dangerous hour and task. RAF and American bombers soften up inland German positions in a true coordination of land, sea and air hitting power. Down goes wave after wave of bombs, the din of battle in the air, on land and from the sea, reaches a terrific crescendo. For nine hours, the Canadians battled fiercely on Nazi-held and fortified soil. They leave the coast of France in flames. Their objective obtained, these battle-scarred heroes disembark for a well-earned rest. Filmed under fire, the ever-growing British and American air might rains destruction upon French-held ports and over the Reich itself. United Nations flyers maintain daylight raids with constantly increasing frequency. Enemy munition plants are sent skyward. Dock installations and rail centers are hit again and again. Air prelude to the Allied Second Front to come. Official United States Navy pictures of Japan's first great naval defeat. At mid-Pacific, Midway Island, American planes and warships strike a punishing surprise blow that the Japs will never forget. Their invasion plans are scuttled as the Yankees take a telling toll. Four Jap carriers sunk, 28 Jap battleships and cruisers sunk or put out of action, and more than 300 Jap planes destroyed. Enemy airmen try desperately to fight off the unexpected assault, but all in vain. A few escape our furious air and sea barrage. Most of them are destroyed. Six months after Pearl Harbor, and for three hot, sunlit days, the Battle of Midway rages. Here, a Jap surprise invasion meets with a counter-surprise by American forces. The concussion of bursting bombs is deafening as Jap planes drop their eggs of destruction, only to be met by a hail of hot steel. Steel made in the USA to destroy Japs. Heroic Marine gunners stick to their posts and let the enemy have it. Jap planes fall by the hundreds, fall like blazing torches. Flames consume the wreckage of other planes that fail to get through. The Red Cross heroically cares for the scorched and wounded. Midway's oil tanks explode, sending forth a curtain of dense smoke that casts a deep shadow over the battleground below. Smoke and burning oil tanks cloud the skies over Midway as reveille sounds on the third day of the struggle. Amidst this scene of destruction and bravery, the Marines proudly raise the emblem of freedom, the flag of victory. Midway was ready. A momentous victory is won.